Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Parthmore, and I'm the CEO of the Council on Strategic Risk. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. We're really excited to have everybody here, including our special guests. Uh, for a little bit of background on our organization, uh, the Council on Strategic Risk is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank dedicated to analyzing and addressing systemic risk to security in the 21st century. Uh, as such, a major focus of our work is seeking to improve capabilities for addressing biological threats of all kinds, in particular, catastrophic biological threats, no matter what their source. Um, put simply, trying to prevent uh, the type of catastrophic pandemic and uh, biological event we're still experiencing with COVID-19 from happening again in the future. To this end, it's imperative that we learn lessons from uh, the ongoing responses and those of the past few years uh, as we look to shaping a better future. Uh, one critical aspect of this is the rapid development, manufacturing, and deployment of medical countermeasures for concerning pathogens, exemplified by uh, Operation Warp Speed, an astounding U.S. effort to develop vaccines and therapeutics uh, and other ways to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today, our webinar will focus on Operation Warp Speed and some of the other types of collaborations uh, that the U.S. government has led in recent years. Um, and what has enabled these successes. In particular, we're going to focus on the public-private cooperation and partnerships um, that took place, as well as the collaboration across the U.S. interagency, uh, in particular between the Department of Health, uh, Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense, uh, among many other players that had to come together behind that incredible effort. Operation Warp Speed delivered amazing results in a very short time. Understanding the challenges of building on the strengths of this model will be key in enabling the rapid development and use of uh, medical countermeasures uh, to help help future outbreaks as fast as possible. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our colleague, Council on Strategic Risk Senior Fellow Andy Weber, to introduce our special guest today. Well, thank you, Christine, and, and thanks everybody for joining this Council on Strategic Risks event, especially the members of the Alliance to End Biological Threats, which has now grown to over 50 allies. Um, we have some amazing speakers today. Uh, first will be Dr. Matt Hepburn, who is Senior Advisor on Pandemic Preparedness to the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Eric Lander, in the Executive Office of the President, AKA uh, Director of Mission Control for the Pandemic uh, Prevention Plan. Uh, prior to his role at OSTP, uh, Dr. Hepburn directed COVID vaccine development under the Countermeasures Acceleration Group, formerly known as Operation Warp Speed, where he provided oversight for the investment in six COVID vaccine platforms. And uh, I, I had my Moderna booster uh, this morning, so I want to thank you, uh, especially Matt, for making that possible. And it's just amazing to think of how successful OWS and the follow-on have been, and how many lives have been saved by your efforts. Um, Matt, I'm going to call you Matt. Um, yeah, please. He also served as the uh, Joint Project Lead of Enabling Biotechnologies for the Department of Defense Joint Program Executive Office for CBRN Defense, where he implemented the DOD Vaccine Acceleration Project, which provided investments critical to the initial actions for Operation Warp Speed. Uh, Dr. Hepburn had extensive experience across DOD. Uh, he was a colonel in the U.S. Army until his retirement. He served six years at DARPA, including running their pandemic prevention plan uh, program, and um, where he invested in, among other things, mRNA vaccines and monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies and other platform technologies. He also served previously at the White House. Uh, as Director of Medical Preparedness for the National Security Council. And it's just amazing uh, to have him with us today. And we can't wait to hear now that you're a full, maybe two weeks into- I'm official. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's two official. weeks, two weeks, I, two and a half weeks. Look, I, they have a thing on the back here too, in this conference room. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> fantastic. That's figuring fantastic. it all out, figuring out where to take a Zoom call. That's, that's been, that took me two weeks. So um, that's great. Yeah. So, so happy to punch and, right in. What and, I wanted to Well, Matt, let me, let me just, uh, before we do that, let me introduce Monique, our second speaker. Oh yeah, please do. Yeah. Get, yeah. get that out of the way. And then, and then we'll just get talk. right into it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we're also, Honored to have uh, Dr. Monique Mansoura, 
um, Executive Director for Global Health Security and Biotechnology at the MITRE Corporation, where she focuses on the sustainability of the biodefense industrial base. At MITRE, Dr. Mansura was also part of the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition. I think she, it was her idea actually, uh, which brought together healthcare organizations, technology firms, nonprofits, academia, and startups in order to more effectively deploy healthcare resources. Dr. Mansura has extensive experience in the biopharma industry, especially in building innovative public-private partnerships, and has been involved in some of the most vital scientific issues of our times, including the Human Genome Project. She led the policy planning and budgeting for a multi-billion dollar medical countermeasure development and acquisition program in the United States under the authorities of Project BioShield Act of 2004 and the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act of 2006. Her unique background, which cuts, cuts across industry, government, and academia, will lend a valuable uh, perspective to our conversation today. I can't think of two better uh, thought leaders. Um, so we're gonna begin by having um, some remarks um, from Matt Hepburn, and who's a, just a dear friend of, of decades, and, and I love him to death. And uh, please uh, start populating the Q&A uh, with your questions so we can get right into those. I think Christine and I will have a couple of questions to kick it off. So go ahead, Matt. All right, uh, I'll, and I will. I'll try to be brief because uh, this—that's always about the questions, and I really want to hear what Monique has to say. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, just a few observations on Operation Warp Speed, um, and a few observations on kind of the new role now and, and and how they come together. I mean, I think the punchline message is is that. Um, there, I think I think this awful, awful pandemic that there's been tremendous progress in some areas and the strategy going forward is actually make sure that we take what actually worked pretty well or eventually worked and make that the new normal. And then we say, OK, here's how we're going to do even better. Here's how we're going to fill gaps where we didn't do so well. That's 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 the plan. Um, so so I'd like to, you know, the, the general comment on Operation Warp Speed for this audience especially is, is that, you know, government can work. And uh, for those uh, for the naysayers and the curmudgeons and everybody who, you know, sort of says, well, you know, has all these examples of where the government fails and it's too bureaucratic and everything else. I, I love having shining examples of where government can work. And there's dozens, dozens and dozens and dozens of examples in everyday life uh, before the pandemic. And, and there's a lot of, there's tons of heroes in the, in the United States government, in the state and local governments and public health and everywhere else. And certainly the private sector that, that did some things really well during this pandemic. But I do feel like that was catalyzed by the United States government and that you, the government, we need, the federal government will need to continue to play a role in this space. And, and I would advocate for a very strong leadership role um, going forward. I think the, um, the uh, Andy alluded to this idea of where the Department of Defense and Health and Human Services came together. And, uh, and that was magical. That was a big, that was a unique, it, it was, it was a unique blend of, I guess it was, uh, you know, maybe maybe a better version of decades of cooperation. So I think as, as most of you are probably aware, you know, the Department of Defense, where I come from, where Andy comes from, has maintained uh, programs to address both naturally occurring infections and, 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 bio, and biological threats, intentional use of biological agents, things like that. And, and we've been doing that for a very long time. And we've worked with Health and Human Services ever since I started doing this 20 some years ago and the, but the the collaboration has always been you're doing this you you do this part I'll do this part and you know sometimes that's complementary hopefully it's not in competition and 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 rarely it can be synergistic but it's it's almost always been we have our programs you have your programs let's just tell each other about it and and warp speed broke the mold on that and said there there's one program and 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 when you reflect back on, you know, April, I just remember like March and April and really in May when this was coming together. And it was like, well, um, as Andy mentioned, I, I had been working on trying to accelerate some different DOD technologies and getting monoclonal antibodies into the system, things like that. It was like, well, what's going to happen to my DOD programs and what is BARDA going to do and how's it all going to fit together? And, and it was like, 
just forget it. <laughs> okay, it's one program. Okay, it's one program. It's one team. It's one fight, and uh, and and it's all going to come together. And, and it's like, well, you know, I, I had this really cool program over here in DoD, and you know, and it was it like, do we absolutely need it for Operation Warp Speed? And if the answer was no, then you know that program could maintain, but it wasn't going to be prioritized, and it wasn't going to be um, where we were going to put our energy. Uh, I think there was you know, leadership is about priorities. And with with Monsef and General Perna, with John Mascola at NIH, with the BARDA team, I mean, it was, we struggled, but we said, here are the priorities. Here, here you, you remember too, it was, uh, we originally started with vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And not that diagnostics wasn't important, but, you know, when we really considered it and started to go into the machinations of Operation Warp Speed, it was, it, it didn't make sense to run our model similarly to vaccines and therapeutics. So you ended up with a RADx program and a lot of testing. We can talk about that another time. But the point is, it was about priorities and it was, re it was about priorities, but it was really about bringing this one team together. And one of the remarks I make a lot about Operation Warp Speed and was from HHS people who said, you know, I, I actually really had no idea that the Department of Defense did this. And what they meant by this, it was operational planning. It was operational planning. It was supply chain analysis. It was actually, you know, cutting edge contracting using other transactions and really, really well negotiated contracts. Um, and it's it's things that we as Department of Defense people were like, well, how could you not know this? <laughs> I mean, it's like that's what we do every day. And it's like, what, what what do you think the military does? It plans operations. It plans contingencies. It it plans for a living, right? And so. Um, and and it, it was it was refreshing to bring the two cultures together, and I think for HHS to sort of see the value of of that Department of Defense culture, and and further what was effective from a leadership standpoint, which came from General Perna on down, is that you know we're not going to be obnoxious. That it wasn't about okay, we're going to come in and the Department of Defense is now in charge of the operation or anything else. Like the the expression that General Perno used very frequently was leading from behind, and what he meant by that is contributing to the public health leadership, public the the the, the public health expertise, the HHS expertise was the right folks to lead. The response, um, the DoD, but we came in and said, "Hey, we have a lot to offer," and and there, you know, it was it was mutual respect on both sides, and that's not automatic, you know, and that it starts at the top, and you you know, that's again where where leadership was so powerful. Um, I do want to make a couple. Uh, there, there's tons to talk about, but we'll leave it for question and answer. I, I want to transition a little bit more now into AP three um, or the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, so that's my purpose. I'm I'm here. I'm here <laughs> for who who knows how long. But I'm not here to do like eight things. You know, it, it is like okay, here's the plan. Make it happen. Um, I mean, that's it. So so for a, for a former or current DoD guy. That's, you know, music to my ears, you know, you got a mission, <laughs> a clearly stated mission and, you know, we can, we can do great things once we've done that. And I, and I give credit to Eric Lander, the team that's been here um, to put that plan together and to make it public. Now it's, it's not a detailed plan. It's not perfect. Um, uh, I think it's a great start. I think there's a lot of goodness in that plan. There's a lot we can work with. And right now we're going through a DOD process again called mission analysis, where we're figuring out, okay, what does it mean? How do we get it done? What do we want to tweak? And then, you know, put together some different, you know, big alternatives, course of actions, things like that. Um, the the part that we're struggling now, and I had a I had some really nice conversations with Monique about this and others is, uh, is priorities. And so for, for anyone that's sort of served, it's probably, this probably transcends kind of my, my experience, but uh, of course it transcends my experience. But the, when you come over and work over at, uh, in, in a, like a national security council or in an OSTP type role, uh, you, you know, there's like 80 things and everybody says, you know, hey, my issue is most important. And the most challenging thing, and this is, I'll give, uh, for those of you that know Carter Metcher, who kind of mentored me my first go around, you know, he was like, look, you gotta, you're, you're only going to be able to get a few things done. 
it, you, you have to you have to be very very deliberate about prioritization and just other people can do other things or the departments can continue to do good work and that's okay but here at a white house level you have to prioritize a few things and it's really a struggle frankly um what the good news that we've been doing so far is that if if you look across it's not it's not just me and it's not just the office of science and technology policy but um if if we if we work across the different groups within the white house and then sort of leverage the best of our government um then we're going to be unstoppable I, I kind of made that point today and it was in the context of you know when you can truly get the the different expertise and resources of the federal government all rowing to the same cadence and moving forward again it's it's unstoppable and the the fun part now is is that we have this really nice team i think probably all of you know beth cameron and over at national security council we have a great people at domestic policy council it's, it's actually it's a really nice group here who we can collectively you know they'll have some priorities we have some priorities the, the magic, if we can pull it off, is kind of synchronizing those things. Um, where we're going to be, we're going to be spending good time in the space, at least out of the gate, in the in in uh, vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics. And I think if you see, if you look at the publicly available plan, and then you go to the appendix, there's a lot more details, and so it's a it's a it's a good starting point for us. And I'll just make the comment: there there's certainly loads to do in that space too. But um, what I'm excited about is is looking at Operation Warp Speed, um, making making the point of we enjoy that we had we had the success that we did uh, for about a minute, and then you kind of look and there there are a lot of things we could have done better, and there is a lot of things that I look back and say, well, I wish wish I would have thought of that, or I wish we would have put more here and put less there. Um, there are tons of lessons there tons and tons that we can learn. And so derived from that, um, looking at, you know, it, you, again, you can go to the AP3 plan and you can see it tick through. My final point along those lines though, is, is that in, in the AP3 plan, we talk about viral families and sort of this idea of, you know, I think a lot of that's inspired by Barney Graham and the NIH, but the idea is, is that, could you say within these families, are the viruses similar enough where you can find a common target? So could you get cross protection? Um, think about a universal influenza vaccine or think about a universal coronavirus vaccine or, or those types of, of actions. And the, the effort really proposes looking, you know, developing vaccines kind of broadly and seeing if we can develop those, see if we can come up with these cross protective or, or universal vaccines. The reason why that's so important is, is that, um, and, and this isn't my own thought, this is, I was on an NIH panel and John Mascola brought this up, but, uh, and, and others were super articulate on this, is that, you know, it turned out that the spike protein put into an RNA platform was incredibly immunogenic and protective. And that was not automatic. <laughs> like there, there was no, there was no like declaration that this spike protein uh, is going to induce a long-term highly protective immune response. We didn't know that. We really had, you know, a lot of it was based on previous coronavirus work, but you know, it worked out, and it's good that it did. And we learned a lot. You know, all the all the work in vaccines for the past fifty years, all of that that current effort was built on those shoulders, but. That, that may not happen again. And, and we may not figure out the right antigen and we may not figure it out right away, or it may take three antigens, or it may take a bunch of trial and error with you know, five different vaccines in early, in early studies before we can even select on the one to build. And so if that process takes a year, well, that would be, a, that would be disastrous, right? So, so we, have to, we can't assume we're gonna just pick the right antigen out of the gate. And we have to build out that capability that we can get to the right antigen really, really soon, and then solve the other you know, massive challenges of the, of, the, of, the, of the scaling and the clinical trials and all that other stuff. So let me stop there. Great. Um, Monique, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, and 
I, I hope it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's a good or bad thing, but I think there's a lot of, um, what's gonna look like copy paste in my remarks, to what Matt just said, and we didn't coordinate, we didn't plan, um, but it's clear we're aligned on some, what some of the key issues and actions that are needed. Um, so let me try and sort of recraft that in my uh, in in um, a slightly different way. Let me start with a disclaimer, uh, Andy. The COVID nineteen healthcare coalition. I'm immensely proud of of what uh, happened with that coalition last year, but it was not my my idea. Um, uh, industry and private sector came to us and was seeking leadership. They had a lot of capability. They had a lot of um, energy around wanting to contribute to the COVID-19 response. And uh, uh, with great credit to uh, Jay Schnitzer, our chief technology and chief medical officer at MITRE, uh, we stepped up to play a coordinating role, stood up an op center over a weekend after Friday, March 13th. And what started as half a dozen sort of interested parties from the private sector, including Mayo Clinic and some professors at MIT, evolved into dozens then hundreds of entities that MITRE had the privilege of leading um, through um, much of uh, 2020 to really harness again the capabilities. So, um, so I appreciate uh, you acknowledging that. It's uh, again, something that uh, uh, not unlike Operation Warp Source, we grew up organically, but you know, really rallied to contribute in a meaningful way to our nation's response. Um, I wanna thank Christine and Andy uh, for leading and organizing this event and for everything that you're doing at CSR. Um, it's a privilege to be on this panel with Matt, of course. Uh, I've known Matt for uh, probably as long as the 20 years that I've been in this space uh, in his roles at, at DARPA and JPO in the White House. Uh, so uh, again, a real privilege. Uh, you know, Again, we, he talked and I'll talk a lot about how important leadership is. And I think we're looking at it on the other side of this panel right now and we're grateful for it. Um, what, what is critically important, I think, from, from my perspective, my 20-year arc of having been literally since 9-11 redirecting my career from drug development for rare diseases uh, after the sequencing of the human genome uh, for the first time and working with Francis Collins on developing drugs for cystic fibrosis after he and teams around the world identified the gene, um, to really then wanting to redirect. It was, the threat was real and present. It was clear we were vulnerable and we weren't prepared. That was the sort of post 9-11 sort of assessment. Um, here we are, fast forward 20 years later, um, much better capabilities. A lot of what has been built over the 20 years was le leveraged uh, in part um, by Operation Warp Speed and now the Countermeasure, Countermeasures Acceleration Group. Um, and just like uh, Matt, a lot of soul searching, keep the things that are good, build on the things that are good, recognize that not everything uh, um, was executed or identified uh, in a way that uh, any of us is satisfied with. So I think we all, again, this is a, a tragedy of historic nature, the loss of lives and livelihoods, uh, the asymmetric burden on the vulnerable and, and underserved populations. These are all critical issues that um, we never um, want to see again in any event moving forward. And that's his career commitment, life commitment, uh, as well as mine. Um, I've really benefited um, following my 15 years of government service from then going uh, to business school and then uh, transitioning that education into leading a business unit at a multinational pharmaceutical company in Novartis that had a portfolio of contracts with the U.S. government and other governments around the world for pandemic preparedness and in leading um, a Centers for Innovation and Advanced Development and Manufacturing. Um, and then for the past four years being at MITRE uh, and serving in a nonprofit organization that is neutral, objective, data-driven, evidence-based, and to really study the problem, having lived in both of the public sector and private sector entities that are central to the discussion we'll have today and central, I think, to mission outcomes. Um, so with that as background and context, let me just uh, set number one, a core framework, and then three messages that I, uh, I want to sort of start with. Um, the core framework um, is in part the identi identity crisis of this mission space. And by that, I think we have all struggled, um, and many of us have said that this is a national security mission. Um, I think, again, if you look at the devastation to lives, to uh, our economy and economies around the world and lives around the world, uh, there is nothing on par with this event um, with regard to those very, um, uh, I think, uh, fair metrics about the, the devastation of this type of an event. Yet, I think many of us will also recognize we don't have a seat at the national security table that gives us voice against these types of threats. Um, I think with leadership like, like Matt, 
Hepburn and Dr. Lander having a seat at the cabinet now, these are significant events, right? These are significant representations that having that voice and, and ideally also having the resources, and that's something I'll talk about a little bit later. So again, is this a national security mission? Um, yes. Is this a matter of economic security? Undeniable, right? Number one, just from the economic hit, that if we're not prepared, we can't absorb these kinds of shocks again. But as importantly, the critical role that the biofuel med tech industry, those that the vaccines, the therapeutics, the diagnostics, played to our bioeconomy. There was just a report from ODNI from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that was released on Friday that identified the bioeconomy as one of five core technologies that the US must retain leadership if we want to retain a position as a superpower. So I think very appropriate that biotechnology, the bioeconomy was, was up there with the top five along with semiconductors, AI, uh, autonomous technologies. Uh, the third lens, of course, is, is foundationally, this is a healthcare, this is a public health, healthcare, global health capability. It, it's day job, you know, for developing drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, is, is to protect um, the health of communities. And so the health lens, the economic security lens, and the national security lens all need to come together and all need to be present as we're thinking about who needs to be at the table? How do we resource this? And to Matt's point, how do we prioritize? Because there's extraordinary competition on priorities for resources and talent. Um, so that's the framework that, that I would ask us all to keep in mind uh, as we think about, you know, where where is the seat and who's, you know, where is the table and who who's uh, who's got a seat at the table? Um, the three the three core messages that I want to lay out just to start the conversation again. Really looking forward to the discussion is. Number one, you have to start with clarity and consistency of your goals at a strategic level. What are you trying to do? And the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan is exactly as Matt said, it is that. It is that North Star. It is that aspirational goal. And it is not the end, but a beginning of a discussion. And Matt has demonstrated it brilliantly, I think, over, you know, since coming on board two, two weeks ago, his willingness to listen and engage with the community and, and sort of refine um, uh, that plan and, and prioritize its goals. So defining the priorities, aligning across the ecosystem, both across the government ecosystem, with, which Matt talked about nicely um, between HHS and DOD, um, measuring progress. How do we know if we're moving in the right direction toward what we're aspiring to achieve? And then financing. Um, execution is key. Um, I am a big fan of the uh, you know, the attributing this to an Apollo mission-like program um, because it had that clarity and that commitment of uh, goals over time that was resourced and, and accountable. And I think that's exactly what, what we're looking for here. Um, the other element uh, is having those meaningful measures. I know there, there had been many um, efforts before this pandemic to assess how prepared we were um, and, and it's one thing not to be prepared. It's another thing to be surprised that you're not prepared. And I think that surprise, that assessment of are we prepared and for what, I think that's you know wanting to avoid fighting the last war is another core issue. Um, and something Matt's talked about, and I know that it is core to the 10-point action plan MITRE has developed in consultation with uh, world-class experts from around, uh, around government, academia, industry, a 10-point action plan for sustaining a biopharma industrial base for a more secure nation. Um, and, and that, again, is the culmination of really 20 years of experience for many of us in, in working with leaders um, uh, like Matt, like Secretary Damzig and Governor Levitt, who you might have heard out of at our Grand Challenge Power Hour last week. But test and evaluation is a core feature of that. How do you know? You don't know until you test and evaluate. You know, I'm a baseball fan. I'm watching the World Series. These guys have been practicing since February, right? Um, they didn't just show up in October. Uh, if you want to show up, you know, in the World Series or at the Super Bowl, you got a lot of practice to do and training to do. And I think that's something that we have to invest in, we have to pay for, um, and that's absolutely critical. Um, one of the lessons there is, is the value of a stockpile is not, the, not only the vaccines or the whatever's in the stockpile, it's how did we get there? How did we make it? What did we learn? Who did we train? I think we have to reassess what the value of developing uh, uh, stockpile is. And I think that's been missing. And I think that's part of the inter-crisis um, uh, business model, if you will. Um, 
The second key, so the first was clarity of goals. Second, leadership and governance. Matt's already touched on that, so I won't say too much more here. Again, um, we're looking at mission control, and I think we're all excited about that. I think there's lots of things to learn about what was in statute currently the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasure Enterprise, or FEMSI, and what role that played, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I think we need to understand that as we're building, um, building mission control. And the third thing, again, is, is the who and the how. And this is really the who is industry. Industry is going to provide the goods and services that the government needs. And we're, yeah, I hope we spend a lot of time in the duration of this. Um, we talk about public-private partnerships. We talk about supply chain resiliency. What I really and our, our MITRE team has really advocated is, is we need industrial policy. We need a strategic level look. We don't just need a transaction between our government and a company and a contract. We need to look at how our industrial base compares to that of, of others around the world and what our capacities and, and capabilities are and how we position the US to not only to be able to provide for our population, but to be, I think, as we intend in global health security, a provider of these assets for many in the rest of the world who are less able um, to provide that. So industrial policy is something central to the work that we're doing at MITRE. I think it elevates the discussion. It's a leader to leader discussion between the CEOs and industry and the leaders in government. Um, and then you can break it down to, to supply chain resiliency, but it really is that um, industrial policy that is core. And then, you know, again, I, I touched on this, we'll need to talk about this, the realities of making a business case so that we sustain investments over time. We failed to do that time and time again in between the crises. Uh, we have financed this mission by supplementals. And so we're really looking to get to a steady state that will give you know, industry in particular the confidence and, and credibility that we will be there over time in between events to build the capabilities that we will call on during the event. So I'll pause there. Great, well, <clears throat> thanks, Matt. And thanks, Monique. Um, you touched on a few things. This national security imperative of preventing pandemics, and I also believe that having a good, strong system of early warning and rapid countermeasures, fast manufacturing surge capacity can deter deliberate uh, bio threats. And that very much needs to be a national security and, and defense mission. I worry a little bit about backsliding, frankly. Uh, after Operation Warp Speed, DOD seems to be going backwards. They disbanded their COVID task force. The secretary's COVID advisor resigned and uh, their budget for the Chem Biodefense Program, which is the premier program of DOD for um, countermeasure development and, and early warning um, was cut 10% by the, uh, the Trump administration and another 10% by the Biden administration. And I think Monique mentioned funding the supplementals. We had um, uh, a lot of supplementals, but it needs to get into the core budgets of the agencies. Uh, I've called for uh, 10 plus 10 over 10, uh, a $20 billion a year investment split between HHS, DOD, Department of Energy, um, uh, Department of Homeland Security, sustained over 10 years for a, a $200 billion investment. And I think we can achieve President Biden's objective of a, that he laid out in national security Memorandum number one of, of a world safe and secure from biological threats, whether deliberate, accidental, or natural. Um, so that needs to be the goal. My question for the two of you, and Monique, why don't you start since you mentioned uh, stockpiling and then Matt can follow up. How should we think about innovation, um, the government working with startups where the innovation really happens, uh, and particularly, um, as it relates to the program programmable platforms for countermeasures and the manufacturing piece, that surge capacity. How do, what's the right mix? How do we think about innovation in stockpiling and surge rapid manufacturing uh, going forward? Yeah, Andy, it's such an important question. Let me take that in a couple of parts. When you think about um, driving innovation and having scale to manufacture, I mean, this is something this industry does every day. Right. This is their this is their core mission is to innovate new products again in the healthcare system um, to uh, protect and save lives. Um, they have the large companies again. I think what we've recognized here 
um, often have the, the speed and scale. This is in part, and Matt can speak more to this, the partnership between BioNTech and Pfizer. Pfizer had speed and scale as a large multinational pharmaceutical company. Um, Moderna had to build it as it went, again, leveraging CDMOs and other capabilities that were established. So there's different models. Um, but this is not, not necessarily a new model. I, I think about the very first medical countermeasure program the US government had after 9-11, and that was ACAM 2000, uh, the next generation smallpox vaccine. Uh, the innovation was at a small biotech company, Acambus. Um, uh, the, the industrial scale capability was provided through a partnership uh, with Baxter uh, that had the manufacturing know-how and could support the scale up and, and the development of product. Um, not unlike Operation Warp Speed, after 9-11, before the end of 2001, there was a commitment made by the US government. Again, we had extraordinary leaders like DA Henderson and General Phil Russell um, leading the charge uh, that made a commitment that we will have enough smallpox vaccine for every citizen. And those contracts were written, those commitments were made, scale up was done at, you know, before um, we had phase one clinical trial results. So there's precedent. The question is what happened in between in part? You know, um, that risk taking, that commitment, it's much harder to do in the preparedness phase than it is in the response phase. Um, and I think trying to recreate Operation Warp Speed or what we saw post 9-11 with the smallpox vaccine development program and taking these bold, extraordinary risks is something we're all looking to, uh, I think, retain um, for all future events. But industry, back to your point, um, what industry doesn't do is do things as fast as what the government will call for. Right. So if we want that speed element in our portfolio, and we do um, for threats, both known and unknown, uh, again, I think this is where we have to practice. Um, this is where, and Matt's called out some great potential examples, whether it's Burkle Daria or, you know, the, the example I had was H7N9 in 2013 when we thought that might be the next pandemic. And you actually run the drill and you, you learn a lot. Um, and you realize there might be capabilities you need where businesses need to make a B2B partnership. And businesses are good at that. Again, they do this every day. If they need a capability, they know how to find it. Now, if the government can facilitate or support that, um, that's an important role for the government to play too. But I think those are a couple of key points, Andy, as we think about tapping into the ecosystem, both the small innovative companies and the larger companies like Novartis. When I was there, we were privileged to have an mRNA uh, DARPA contract right back in 2013, 2014, a great DARPA program manager in Dan Wattendorf. Um, and again, it's a great example of how the government was driving this technology almost a decade ago. Um, the question is, was it managed like an Apollo project, Apollo mission project? Because um, that's part of, I think, where the opportunity is going forward is once you have one of those really promising technologies, how do you push it uh, you know, to either fail fast or succeed brilliantly? So to match point, you're not guessing if Spike is gonna provide, you know, sufficient immunoprotection um, when we knew coronaviruses were a threat. So I think there's lots of opportunity space here. That's great, Monique. Thanks for that really extraordinary and comprehensive answer. Matt, what do you have to add? Uh, that was awesome. Um, love, love the exercise thing. <laughs> so that's, as General Ferner would say, you and I are nested. That's what I always used to say. So, I mean, it's like, absolutely. And, and I think, I don't know what those exercises are going to look like. I, I think we shouldn't forget eight, seven and nine is a great example, Monique. Like, like we're, we're actually, first of all, we got to get through this pandemic and, and we may have scenarios of COVID goes away for a while. And then we get, you know, a really nasty variant that kind of ca causes a wave in a year or two. I mean, they're, they're, who knows that we're in an unpredictable future. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't think there's going to be a desert where preparedness isn't going to have much to exercise on. Um, we may have to lean in a bit and we may say, OK, eight, seven and nine may or may not be bad, but we're going to lean in because not only are we going to get ahead of it, but we're also going to practice. Um, I think Monique said something really, really cool in her comments, though. I want to highlight it um, on training. And and I, I, I really I love that concept, the idea that. Um, we're creating a, a group of professionals in our government, um, and you can even say in the private sector, private sector allies and great people in biotech who are comfortable working in government type relationships, working in pandemic preparedness, um, and, and that we collectively are going to get better because we do these things. And, and the idea like, well, we're 
we're developing a medical countermeasure, or even as Monique said, you know, we're going to stockpile a medical countermeasure because not only do we think we're going to need it, but we don't know, but also just going through this endeavor is going to allow us to get better at it. And it's, it's like, well, why would we spend money on that? That could be a ton of money. Look at what the Department of Defense does for training. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, look at what the Department of Defense does for um, professional development. I mean, the, they, they'll send you to school for a year at a time, you know, and, and you, you do and then you kind of do more education and you do more education. Like it's, it's a very deliberate process that's not, you know, and, and it's not like, oh, you have to have a product at the end of it. I mean, the, the product product is is that you are prepared and you're ready and and I think it's it's a kind of an if we think about it frame it that way um I think training uh regulatory expertise at the FDA you know wouldn't that be a top priority training them in next generation manufacturing not that they need training more than I do or anybody else but but BARDA professional development and training plans you know the all you, you, you wait why aren't we, it, it's always kind of like, well, we don't have money to do that. That's, that's ridiculous. I, I think we, I think we need to train. Um, and the best way, how does the military train? Well, you go to classrooms and stuff like that. And then they send you out in the California desert to the national training center, you know, and um, that's not free, but that's, but that's what they do. And so I, I like this, I, if we can kind of accept that we're going to be going through in, in quotations, exercises, not tabletops, but actually making products and driving that through from um, I think we'll be much better prepared. Uh, Monique also brought up industrial policy. I think that's really, really, really interesting. And it's uh, I think the, the the playing field is now so different than it was pre-pandemic that this is a really interesting time to vi- revisit the biotech ecosystem in our country and just lots of different things. And it's a it's a nice issue to work at this level because it is very very sort of cross functional. So I, I you know we may we're, we it's not an issue we would own as part of the pandemic preparedness plan, um, but it's an issue where we can be very we can be a good example of why we need it and why we need to do uh, do a lot of things differently. Um, I, the other, I guess my final comment on um, the, the stockpiles is that, you know, I, I don't mind having stockpiles for, for current and future threats for the reasons Monique articulated. Um, what I hope is, is that Number one, this is the argument for getting better at prediction. So we have a good idea on what's going to happen. If we predict better, we can start sooner. And it's another, and it's also an argument for rapid scaling as well. And so um, I think we're going to get better in both of those areas. Uh, where you know, we're, I'm very excited, frankly, about the ability to kind of scale vaccine manufacturing. I think I think we're going to put a lot of energy and priority to that. Um, uh, but I I think that that's that's going to be transformation. Um, as well. And, and also Thanks. distributed. So, um, distributed, yes, scaled and distributed, yes. Sorry. Since we're at about 15 minutes left, we're going to go to some audience questions now, which I'm moderating here. Um, but thank you. And also, we're 100% on board with uh, ramping up testing and evaluation and making it annual, a regular cycle that we've been pushing for. So great to hear, great minds thinking alike. Hopefully, we can all push in that direction. Uh, one of the first questions was from um, one of the most talented people I used to work with at the Department of Defense, Kate Vander, uh, that we'll throw it out. And I'm going to kind of riff on her question a little bit and weave together a few of your comments as well. So uh, her question was how reliant Operation Warp, uh, Operation Warp Speed's success was on leadership. So in other words, did it come down to sort of personalities? And if whether, you know, whatever degree that's the case, um, are there organizational processes and tricks that you can kind of get into the system as resilience in case that leadership at a, at a given time of a crisis is not there. And I would say to put this together bigger as well, you both spoke, spoke about needing to prioritize bio issues as a national security issue and really carry that prioritization with it. Um, I hope that we can get much more in that direction in that mindset and that bio just becomes a huge priority for the nation writ large, including in the national security side. Hopefully that will help resolve part of Kate's question. Our advocacy is sort of, let's do both. Let's create some institutional methods as well as try to grow good leaders and push sort of in both directions to be able to address biological threats better in the future. So curious uh, if either of you have specific thoughts on this or specific tricks that you uh, think should be adopted going forward. 
Yeah, maybe I'll start briefly and then um, I think it, it's it's to my previous point that, that leaders are trained and, you know, uh, tra training leadership in biodefense um, at the very, you know, at the company commander level, all the way to the general level, like that, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the military doesn't just take somebody and make them a four star general, right? You know, it's, it's a very deliberate career path. I think that that should inspire across our government for those that work in the national security space, those that work in this biodefense space. Um, so, so it wasn't, it wasn't like coincidental, like, oh, we were so lucky we had General Perna and it's like, you know, no, we had a, a four-star general that was in charge of Army Material Command and one of the, the best logistic experts probably in our nation. Um, so, and, and also, you know, Monsef Salawi from, uh, as a pharmaceutical executive, uh, that that was extraordinarily helpful. And, and so we do have to, one of the other things we got to get better at, and I know, Monique, you totally agree with this, is like, it, it's good, like I'm, I'm a career government guy, right? So I'm, I'm okay. It's great to have people who have really good private sector experience and then they come into the government and then it's okay if they go back out of the government, but then they can come back into the government. And, and sort of this, this idea of, hey, it's pretty easy for you to come in and learn about what we do, uh, or you know maybe we'll bring you in to help us out during a crisis. I think uh, an area where that, where, where we, really need help in that space is, is manufacturing expertise. Um, that, that private sector expertise in our government would be incredibly valuable. Um, the, so, so lots, lots of, lots of interesting models there, but I don't think, uh, we can't rely on one-off leadership. My final point though, is that when we talk about the department of defense, um, you know, I probably should be a little bit careful, but I'll follow kind of Andy's lead on this is that, you know, it's, it's a commitment to, it's a commitment that the department of defense is an instrument of national security. Um, if so, um, you know, as much as we would like to say the national security landscape will be static and that'll give us plenty of time to have acquisition cycles and 10 year planning and we can map out careers and, you know, wouldn't that be great? Um, it's not going to be, it's going to be ridiculously dynamic. And, you know, so, so why, you know, I think that the Department of Defense can't say we only do this part of national security. They have to say, look, we're going to be, the, we're going to be one of your go-to organizations during a crisis. And I mean, and I mean, they did like warp speed is a small example. And we had, you know, mil my military medical physicians and, and healthcare providers in the Javits Center in New York City and the National Guard and all these and on and on and on. Thousands of examples where the, where the Department of Defense contributed. And uh, I think I think we have to sort of say and, and, and DOD, we, we probably will next time, too, if that's what our nation needs and just sort of accept that. Monique, do you have anything to add? I think what, what Matt said, I, I would echo a lot of that. I, I think, again, training it, recognizing it, where it is and where it isn't, I think, and we heard this from Secretary Danzig as well in his remarks to our MITRE uh, uh, Power Hour recently and, and to PCAST recently, right? Uh, you, you need to understand not only the science, leadership in science, but leadership in the management of science. I think what Monsef Slawi is a pharmaceutical executive, uh, having to make a lot of hard decisions, go, no, go decisions, portfolio strategy, um, uh, you know, really understanding uh, that position and that capability, I think, is absolutely vital. I think understanding industrial policy. I think being, uh, I love the idea that Matt brought up, that bringing that talent in, um, I, I think there's also a bit of a cultural issue that I think we have to take on head on, right? This uh, a little bit of a uh, industry is, um, uh, you know, they are part of the part of the community, part of the first responders. Uh, they're not the enemy, they're not the dark side, right? I think we have to really view them as, as part of the solution, part of the team that is going to achieve the things we're all aiming to achieve. Um, and and I, I think many of us, I know I uh, regularly run into sort of just a cultural sort of resistance um, to closer engagement with industry. There are issues of COI absolutely that need to be worked out. But um, I think uh, a closer integration, my experience working in both worlds, again, a fish doesn't know water, right? Uh, the, the 15 years I spent in government, there was a lot of awakening when I got into industry uh, and having to brief a CEO about justifying why a government partnership was in the company's best interest. And, and I think on the other hand, you know, live a day in the life of Van Hepburn in the White House, right? If you're, if, if you're coming from industry and, and all of the incomings constantly. So, uh, 
I think this exchange um, of leadership talent um, and, and training uh, very intentionally is absolutely vital to the, the success. Excellent, thank you both. Uh, next, I'm gonna roll a couple of questions together. Um, one is, what's the best structure, do you think, for Operation Warp Speed when it's not crisis time going forward? Uh, as part of that, are there a few parts where uh, OWS fell short uh, or took a wrong turn and had to correct? And what will you be taking from that as you think about um, helping to, uh, in both of your cases, try to push ideas forward and help create what that future looks like? Yeah, I'll, I'll highlight a couple and then turn it over to Bonnie. Because I think first is um, the uh, maybe answer the second question first. Yeah, the, there's a lot, there's a lot, of, lot to be learned from Operation Warp Speed, and and we're going to incorporate that. I think um, a, a theme. Let me just give you an example theme. Um, I think you know what the what the Food and Drug Administration did. You know, during this crisis was just extraordinary, and it's it wasn't just Operation Warp Speed. You look at we. I was recently in a conversation about with the diagnostics about CDRH. I mean, literally reviewing hundreds and hundreds of emergency use authorization applications and still, and now they're getting hundreds more. Uh, and so, so those professionals have been amazing and they've been overworked and they, they've done a really good job. I, I think we, it's, but I think it can be very transformational if they're on the cutting edge of next generation technology, and then they can provide clear guidance in that. And so that, that strikes me as, as really a point of emphasis, a lesson learned that wasn't necessary. It was, it was a lesson learned of some good things that happened, but also recognizing the enormity of the task that they are going to have uh, not only now because of warp speed or during, you know, during the crisis, but we've set a new normal, you know, in terms of the rapid expeditious review of vaccine applications, and you can expand it accordingly. Um, I think we've created an expectation. Frankly, that's probably a good expectation. You know, if, uh, if, if, if we have a new treatment for breast cancer, if we have a new treatment for all, you know, different lupus or all these different maladies that have, you know, that are so devastating, we should be accelerating those too. And so, so, you know, it's a, it's an area where we want to set the new normal there. Um, I think the, um, it, you know, how do we make, how do we make warp speed more permanent is, is a really interesting question that I haven't figured out. And I'd love to get feedback from Andy and your team on this. Um, I think uh, the, the FEMC is a, is a great coordination mechanism. I think we should be really thoughtful on how to make it better. Um, the beauty of warp speed was that it was temporary. I mean, it was no, no one's there sort of carving out your bureaucratic thing for the next five years or something like that. I mean, it was intended to be very temporary and very specific and mission focused. And that there's beauty in that, especially in our government. And so I, you know, what, what we establish more permanent, I'm not sure. Um, I, I kind of like the idea of saying we will construct task forces that will be uh, warp speed like for a crisis response. Um, but with the Full in, and exercise that we go back to that exercise theme, but the full intention is is that it has a one year, it has a it has an expiration date at one year, and that we're not gonna we're not gonna create a lot of additional bureaucracy. I can just build on that. Maybe uh, you know we don't want a bureaucracy, but we do want performance, and we need performance in between crises. And so I think the question is, how do we develop that? Um, that ecosystem of capability across the, the federal government and the multiple agencies, as well as with industry. Again, I think we're all drawing, we're coming back to test and evaluation because that's something tangible we can do that will give us confidence and credibility, not only in the technologies, but in our ability to work together. <laughs> that's as important. Can we contract in a way that is meaningful? Matt talked about the really the critical role that um, writing strong contracts played for both sides, right, of, of, of the contract agreement. Um, uh, you know, the National Academies is currently reviewing the Public Health Medical Countermeasure Enterprise, uh, and, and that report will come out soon, uh, and, and that'll be important, you know, as, as one more data point on, let's look at what happened between 2001 and 20. 20 uh, in the establishment of Operation Warp Speed and learn from that as well. Um, I know Helen uh, Brenswell in part asked the question, she's done some brilliant writing on this. Um, you know, we need to learn from the lessons pre-Operation Warp Speed, pre-COVID-19 as well. Um, a lot of the, you know, the writing that she did, I think in early 2018 about 
who's going to answer the call just because of the nature of the interaction between government and industry. And that's core and central to a lot that came out in our 10 point action plan um, about what happens in between crises. There has to be industry a struggle because they don't know who to go to in this complex government ecosystem. That's a fundamental recurrent failure that we've heard over and over as we've engaged in the industry. So there, I think there has to be, I don't want to say permanence, as long as these threats are out there, there has to be some sort of structure where industry knows where to go in a meaningful way that will provide consistent, clear guidance on what are those goods and services that the government, government needs to draw down risk. Excellent. And then since we're down to the last few minutes, um, I will take the, the liberty of the final question and pose it to all three of you with Andy going last. Uh, and that is uh, with, with all the tragedy and hardship, um, as well as amazing efforts by so many people over the last few years, uh, can you share one thing that gives you hope in terms of our ability to effectively address biological threats going forward? We'll go uh, Matt first, then Monique, then Andy. Yeah, I, I've done these panels. I quote this one number, and it may not even be right, but uh, sort of the, as I understood, pre-pandemic, we make the, the world would produce approximately 4 billion doses of vaccine a year, all vaccines, every single vac flu vaccine and everything else. Um, and, I mean, we're getting up to eight-ish, nine billion doses produced by the end of 2021 and the capability to produce even more and to frankly distribute them to a world population. You, you just think about the extraordinary accomplishment that of the United States, but of really the global community in that. Should have been faster and, and got it. We have lots more work to do on it. But just think about that. Like, think about what then we can do against other vaccine preventable diseases and cancer and, and everything else. Like, if all we all we have to do is just leverage that massive collective effort and keep it going and, and make it make it better. I mean, yeah, sky's the limit in what we can do. Thank you. Monique, point of hope. Christine, I'll come back to where we started, leadership and mission control. Looking at uh, the guy on the screen here, Matt Hepburn, uh, his statement, his clear owning this mission, uh, you know, and uh, I can remember exactly the words. It makes him happy to know that he stepped in to own this responsibility, right? Um, that gives me great hope because none of this happens without great leadership. And I think we're, we're looking at it right here on the screen. So um, it starts there and uh, that gives me a lot of hope for the future. I would echo yeah. that back. Uh, um, a characteristic of yourself uh, in this time as well and add you to that category. I uh, definitely agree. Thanks. And it's great. It's easy. The one thing it's already been done, um, created mission control at the White House and put Matt Hepper in charge with Monique as her, as the wing, <laughs> wing person. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, it's that moment in time, uh, once in a generation, once in a lifetime, we got to do it right this time. We got to resource it. Um, I think 10 plus 10 over 10, $200 billion over the next decade is a reasonable investment. And it needs to be a, a defense and national security priority so we can make this the last pandemic. Cheers to that. Thank you, Andy. Um, and again, I would echo that word investment. Um, these are not dollars that are going up into the ether. They are dollars that are contributing to a vibrant economy and to our science and technology base and manufacturing base and saving lives, uh, potentially at a, at, a, at a really grand scale. So thank you all for that, um, uh, for all of your comments and for joining us. And in particular, thank you for your efforts in recent years to um, create, uh, I think, the starting point of a really bright future for rapid uh, uh, development and manufacturing of medical countermeasures like the world has not ever had before. Uh, and again, hopefully this is just the starting point. Thank you again for your time and thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you again so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.